Hello there! Coming in with another guide video and it's gonna be about one of many people's favorite limited time event of all time. I am very happy to cover this for you in case you might have been too busy celebrating Christmas holidays or you haven't been around during the Winterfest season or you're willing to learn from someone that has gone through a lot more than you think. Then you've come to the right place. I introduce you the ultimate guide to beating Frost Knight. So first of all, what is Frost Knight? In my perspective, Frost Knight is a hybrid mission that is combined between endurance and retrieve the data. Players have to defend the furnace, which is the objective of the mission, build defenses around, prevent the storm circle from shrinking in waves by keeping the furnace burning as long as they can with the blue glow they find around the zone. It may sound easy to some of you, but little did you know, some details you might either missed during your runs or you have not known about it yet, or you don't feel such difficulty out of it. So that is why this guide exists. I will be covering every single aspect for our favorite Winterfest event of all time including quests loadouts waves building farming locations and many more like i said every single aspect in one video before we start i will be putting timestamps in advance for this ultimate guide or i should say a very lengthy video in case you're already aware with some of the subjects and wanting to skip over the ones you have not seen or known yet and for someone that likes to watch uh, the whole thing i give you all of my respect I mean, really. Thank you. Let's start off with the event quest that is available when Frost Knight is around. There are about three categories for the Frost Knight quests. First one is generally Frost Knight itself, giving good amount of tickets and rewards. Second is the Elite Frost Knight, which gives even greater rewards than normal. Third one is the dailies that gives little rewards. Let's start off with the first category. The first category quest of Frost Knight is usually where some quests are repeatable, some can be completed once, and the rest are the weekly Frost Knight with varying modifiers. The rewards are pretty neat if you complete the one-time quest for the first time in your career. They give the lobby music, loading screen, couple event heroes, and schematics as rewards. So I'll try my best to list all of the available quests that so far we can have from top to bottom. Starting with the two repeatable quests, one is a taste of the cold and another is ice picker. The first repeatable is that you are required to survive a total of 30 waves in any number of frost -like matches you run. So let's say you survived until wave 11 in the first run, your progress will not reset and stays at 11. And if you manage to complete the quest during a run that you survived and goes above the total of 30 waves, your progress will continue to count on the same new quest after, which is why it is called a repeatable quest. The second repeatable requires you to break three of the ice blocks you find around the zone in one run. Only three blocks of ice are spawned in one frost night match. I do have a section for all of the ice blocks locations, so if you're interested, you can skip ahead for a peek. That's the first two quests you'll always see for sure. And now with the one-time quests, we have Winter Survival. This is the quest almost everyone was anticipated to complete, especially for people who don't have the event constructor hero known as the Ice King. To complete this quest, you need to survive at least 30 minutes in one Frost Knight match. Definitely an easy one and a good way to grab Ice King if you don't have him. Keep in mind you can only complete this once. After this quest comes the Polar Survival. For this one is about the same method of surviving time period but it's extra 15 minutes after the quest for getting ice king which is a total of 45 minutes in one match upon completion you will receive a neat frost knight loading screen next one is burner fuel you are required to deposit 200 blue glow into the burner in any number of frost knight matches completing it will reward you a frost knight lobby music pack i don't know what it sounds like but at least it's there for you to pick up such cosmetic. Next up is Mist of the North. It's a pretty simple quest that you have to just kill 50 mist monsters for a couple tickets. Another is Cold Traps that you need to craft 50 traps that are rare rarity or higher like epic or legendary, blue, purple or orange. It's to keep it easy with you just in case. 
After that is Cold Hard Cash, where you need to loot 40 chests in any of your Frost Knight runs. Being a farmer on this one will make things easier for you looking for them. I do also have a section of the spawn locations for the loot chests in the video, so feel free to skip ahead to that if you are interested. Lastly, we have furnace a flame where you have to feed the burner blue glow and keep its health above 50 percent for more than 10 waves in any number of frost knight matches you run it doesn't have to be in a single match just to not stress things out once you complete this quest you will receive a schematic of the paper shredder so the rest of the frost knight general quest category are the limited weekly quests the ones with the varying modifiers that comes and goes every week they also give some cool rewards, so I'll plug those weekly quests in the section right when I address every Frost Knight weekly modifier in this guide. Now, the next quest category we are moving on to is the Elite Frost Knight. These quests give really great rewards, huge amount of gold, tickets, and the lovely banners for any certain Frost Knight runs completed in specific terms. Let's begin with the almighty quest many of you ambitiously looked over, the Frost Knight elite quest. In order to complete this quest is to basically complete 20 waves of the highest power level of Frost Knight, rewarding you the burning crown banner and a bunch of golden tickets. Next one is United We Stay Warm, where you have to complete a full run of Frost Knight with a team of four running each different classes. This is very tricky for many people, especially when you try to run in a public lobby just to get this done. I would recommend getting a pre-made team to make this quest easier for you. Last one is the Master of the Krampus Hunt. This elite quest requires you to complete two objectives instead of one. The first objective is to complete Krampus Crazies, which is a daily Frost Knight quest that you will have to pray to the gods of Fortnite that you want this quest to appear in your quest log. We will be looking on to the daily Frost Knight quest soon enough. The second objective is to eliminate 100 lone Krampus. There are only three Krampus spawn one Frost Knight match at a time, so that will definitely take you some time and about 34 matches of Frost Knight to complete this elite quest. And thankfully those 34 matches don't have to be full 20 waves completion. As long as you kill all three throughout the map, it will count towards the quest. Completing it rewards you a funky banner and an event hero, Sentry Gunner Krampus. Now that we looked over the general and elite Frost Knight quest, we can finally have a quick look on the Frost Knight dailies. As per se, they are very easy to complete and give a small amount of rewards. Starting off with the four classes. Frosty Builder, you need to survive for 30 minutes as a constructor in one match. Frosty Looter, the same method but with an outlander. Frosty Shinobi with a ninja. And Frosty Warrior with a soldier. All four of these give the same amount of rewards, and so as the other secondary dailies. Icebreaker daily quest, almost similar to the general Frost Knight quest. Ice Picker, but you have to break seven of the ice blocks, and it doesn't have to be in one match. No fort architect is plain and simple, you just have to place a hundred structures in any match. Lastly, blue glow burner, you will need to feed 15 blue glow to the furnace in a single match. These frost knight daily quests for sure will not make you break a sweat. Those are all of the quests you are able to complete in regular frost knight matches. The weekly ones will be included in the frost knight modifiers section if you want to skip ahead to that. After knowing all the quests for this limited time winterfest event, in preparation we can jump into which one of the most suitable and strategic loadouts you can use during your frost knight runs. Picking the best or the most suitable loadout for your role in Frost Knight is not really difficult to begin with. It depends on what role you really want to do in the match, but if you want your Frost Knight match to be strategically well, there are three types of roles you can possibly use. One is a builder, two is a farmer, and three is damage. Usually we call it DPS, like in every other game out there. For a builder loadout, to be personally honest, you could probably run about any class for being a builder in a frost knight match most of the time it's the people who use constructor loadouts because they have a base that reinforce the structures if you want to be the builder but don't want to be a constructor perhaps i recommend having a pre-made party and have a teammate to run base for you while you can comfortably build and another is at least contributing with their base or even vice versa, both ways work anyway. When it comes to what hero is the best run on the loadouts commander leads for building in Frost Knight, there are so many of them to pick, obviously, but I will list out the most common and top picks for running certain heroes on the builder role loadouts. 
First one is our all-time favorite constructor, Base Kyle, definitely a beginner-friendly pick. His commander perk, Lofty Architecture, increases structure health by 84% affected from his base, which is a huge advantage for a lot of situations. For example, it will take time for Husk to break down one fully upgraded structure, and Smashers won't be able to break the tier 3 metal walls completely when they charge at it, thanks to the constructor class perk as well. His base also has added armor of 60, making your build be able to tank even more damage to do damage reduction. Base Kyle is always gonna be a vital pick as a commander lead. A secondary great pick is Ice King. His frozen castle perk on lead make husks that are standing on the affected structures from his base apply a status effect of snare by 15%. And whenever husks that melee attacks, the walls are gonna be frozen for a couple of seconds. Not the sturdiest, but his base can be very helpful to restrain husks from breaking structures they're going for. As well, useful to freeze charging smashers and also saves time and material when repairing the damaged walls. Another good pick is Power Base. Nox or Penny. Their power modulation perk makes their base be able to self-repair the affected structures by 11% of max health on lead. Most of the time, this perk is usually placed on the support team because the 4% is still not bad at all, but if you want the walls to be a little cheaper to repair or you want your structures to heal bigger and faster, then power base is definitely a way to go. Not the best in terms of damage reduction, but combined with base Kyle or Ice King's bases, it will definitely perform at its best. An unusual pick for builder loadout lead, and it's a ninja class and a werewolf himself known as Dire. His lead perk increases movement speed by 50% and energy costs for abilities are decreased by half during evening and night. Since any frost night match you jump in, it will always be at night time. So Dire's Night Stalker perk will always be active, even as a support perk will still be great. 25% boost gives out a bunch of clunky loadouts out there. So I would honestly say this hero will serve you very well in frost night. Another unusual pick similar to Dire, and it's a budget one in case you haven't gotten Dire. Fleetfoot Ken is also a great lead choice for movement speed. With both Ken and Dire being in either support or lead, the combined movement speed is a boosted of 62.5%. Here is a pro tip you might not know yet. Pretty funny to say that Fleetfoot is technically faster in terms of base speed when his commander perk is boosting your movement speed by 37.5%. Dire's run speed is 410 and Fleetfoot Ken's run speed is a whopping 564, approximately over 150 difference. But still, if you prefer to spend less energy on abilities, you can still use Dire. If you want to move even faster, Fleetwood is your go-to hero. Both can be a good builder for Frost Knight after all. Now that we listed the common heroes for the builder role, we can now move on to the farmer role in Frost Knight. As it lives up to its title, farmers themselves are obviously outlanders. They have the anti-material charge class perk to easily break obstacles and collect materials out of it. And also when outlanders harvest with their pickaxe and hitting anything with it 5 times consecutively, a passive buff activates and they can see searchable objects and containers which they will glow even behind walls. As well as a small boost of pickaxe damage and a bit of movement speed. There are very good outlanders that do really great as farmers for Frost Knight, so I'll list the ones that are very popular among the player base. Our number one farmer is obviously gonna be Cassie Clip Lipman. Her perk High Caliber Harvest on Commander Lead gives a decent bonus to when you use the anti-material charge or any objects you destroy, you have a 100% chance to obtain twice the loot drop of resources. A very useful hero as a farmer for whenever you need twice the loot. Or your builder is building a very huge trap base. Clip in support is still alright. 33% will still not hurt as much since you're still getting double the materials in Frost Knight than in base game. Cassie is a necessary hero for farming and is a must grab. Second farmer hero is Archaeologist. Her perk increases the anti-material charge heavy attack efficiency by 128%. To make this easier for you to understand, she reduces the energy cost of your punch by a lot. 
so you can use the charge way more often and it will only cost you about 20 energy per charge which in my opinion is pretty decent to clear out objects and farm as much resources as possible if your playstyle prefers to punch less but gain more energy fossil selfie is a great farmer hero for frost Knight as well so as long as you are out of shields or use the blast from the past team perk you will have your energy regenerate every second as a commander it is 12 energy per second in support is 4 energy per second it is not only used for the anti-material charge fossil selfie is great for his abilities as well since he is regenerating a lot of energy on lead which makes him a very good farmer and an offense outlander for sure if you have neither any of the outlanders mentioned let's say you've just started off playing and still new to the game or what so but still want to try frost knight for the fun of it there is a budget farmer hero that is and still is a great choice and beginner friendly pathfinder jess will take care of you very well her perk basically increases the pickaxe damage by 50% on commander lead and 17% in support. Not only this hero is just for newbies, but even sometimes I use her in support whenever I don't have a farmer in my frost knight match. Her perk is definitely a great utility in terms of farming without having an outlander. That should be both builder and farmer roles covered. Now we can go to the fun stuff damage or dps rolls basically they are usually the best in dealing great damage towards husks or have a purpose to contribute in certain waves they mostly focus more on elimination waves therefore eliminating husks as fast as possible to get into the next couple waves faster it's not always necessary if you're a casual frost knight player but at least it's great to be or have a teammate that is capable of keeping the husks at bay Starting off with the most common and still the most dominant hero of all soldier loadout, Commando Spitfire remains to be the best and very popular pick. His perk reduces cooldown of the Goan Commando by 66%. In this state of Frost Knight, the matches seems to be very forgiving, so it should not be too bad to run a Happy Holidays loadout to bring up the Minigun Lord into the field. Even if his Minigun is physical damage, he saves you so much resources, materials, and durability of your weapons during your Frost Knight matches. Another great Minigun hero for DPS Commander is, of course, Dike cast jonesy his going commando damage is increased by 50 percent and its element is converted to energy most waves in frost knight especially during end waves have elemental husks so having a teammate that runs an energy based loadout can be very helpful especially when you're struggling to craft things and couldn't kill the lone krampus around the map for example this base game mini boss killer is gonna be your best friend next one is my personal favorite pick sub-zero zenith to be honest with you, he's not a very consistent hero to run in Frost Knight because you are required to have a sniper or a bow to freeze husks or smashers and you'll have to rely so much on RNG you'll get an active power cell to craft the weapon you need as early as possible and that certain weapon you need to craft needs to have a great percentage of critical chance at a point where Sub-Zero Zenith won't deal as much damage as any other DPS loadout his main purpose is to just freeze enemies so when I run Zenith in a high level difficulty of Frost Knight, I can't deal great damage on my own so I just freeze measures or propane husks and hope for the best. This one is most likely everyone's favorite hero when it comes to crowd clearing. Stoneheart Farah is a very popular pick for wiping out huge crowds of husks. On lead, for every shot she shoots with a bow, the arrow splits into multiple small and sharp beams dealing 60% damage to nearby enemies amazing hero as dps and frost knight especially for kill waves still the same approach as the sub-zero zenith you need a weapon to craft as early as possible to make your loadout with her useful otherwise it would be a dead perk without it but still even in support she is a great dps hero to have depending on the strategy and situation now the heroes i listed here are the ones that i personally approached and are very good as commanders for your loadouts they are surely very common but still are the best for frost knight in general there are obviously many ways you can try with different loadouts as long as it works perfectly fine in any of your frost knight runs you may run however you'd like as long as you're comfortable running your own 
like I said, these are just personal approach as to how I look at them and how they perform on my experience. So right now I would like to show a couple of my Pros Night loadouts as an example that I used so far and tried to vary as much as possible so you can get the idea. First one right here is a constructor loadout base Kyle on lead with the recycling team perk because I play Frost Night matches on my own. Sometimes I'm not a great farmer honestly. I have a recycling base that can save me some time while I'm out there building and trapping. It gets me the building materials whenever I need them in any waves. Power modulation and mega base which they both activated my team perk. Bomb suit for added armor. Some damage reduction when you get hit by some gunslingers or a charging smasher. Going coconuts as healing source and it's actually the best source of healing for a long run. I always try to supply myself with coconuts. The 16% damage is alright but this healing is what helps turn the tables in the match and the last support is night stalker for movement speed. Gadgets are also important during the frost night runs so I'll quickly plug which gadgets are great for that. First off is with slow field. This is my favorite gadget of all time. I have it in nearly all of my loadouts because of how broken and game changing this gadget can do. It slows down any crowd of enemies within the field in a tile range for 45 seconds. I definitely recommend this gadget for sure. Next gadget is the stationary hover turret, also another good gadget. The best use for this turret gadget is always deploy them in kill waves. They stay and shoot any husks in a very long range for 30 seconds straight. I would highly suggest this if you're ever gonna run any types of DPS loadout. The teleporter gadget to me honestly is actually more of a utility or a situational gadget. You can use this gadget on your farmer loadout if you feel like wanting to farm in a specific location and don't want to go through the traps where husks can possibly damage you and you don't want that. You can place one pad next to a base or somewhere safe that is next to the burner that you can drop your stuff and another is your farming area. After the teleporter gadget we have the banner. The banner gadget heals any structures around in a tile range and have its max health increased for a certain time and is also a spawn point for your teammates if one of them goes down. I use this one mainly to increase health on the structures that is close to the burner so in case husks or bigger targets are trying to damage them it will be highly unlikely that they'll be able to break them. Proximity mine gadgets. I rarely use this in Frost Knight. I remember using it a long time ago and placing them mines on spawn before any kill waves start. Another good way to speed through a kill wave. If you like using these or are willing to do some sort of speed run then perhaps this gadget might serve you well. Airstrike lives up to its name. This gadget drops down missiles that bombards a certain location. To be honest with you I have never used airstrike in frost knight. Mostly because we always have a lobber shield up or my builder teammate decided to spawn trap or what so. Maybe once in a blue moon occasion one of these frost knight matches will not have a lobber shield built and make airstrike somewhat usable. But in most cases I don't really recommend it because most lobbies will always have a lobber shield built. Next one is actually the most useful for farmers especially. Supply drop is a really great gadget to get extra loot out of farming. Up to max level of this gadget it does not just drop 85 of each building materials but also mechanical parts, traps, ammo and many stuff you can farm for. And lastly adrenaline rush. I can tell its purpose is to heal yourself and other players nearby and as well removes status effects. With it being max leveling gadget, it can revive players. But in Frost Knight, however, you don't get knocked out, you instantly get eliminated when your health goes down to zero. Since we already have coconuts in support, I have this sort of mystifying feeling that this might not be a great gadget to run. In any case, it can only heal you and you have to wait about two and a half minutes just for a small amount of heal which it points out that it can be a waste of space. Now that we know what gadgets are best to use in Frost Knight, I run Banner and Slow Field for my Constructor loadout that I was previously showcasing. Okay, the next loadout I want to show as an example is a Farmer one. 
I have archaeologists on lead to have the antimaterial charge to be cheaper with blast from the past team perk activated by Saurian Focus and Saurian Hide for energy and armor going coconuts as a healing source. Since this is a farmer loadout and picking up a lot of objects will definitely get me a ton of coconuts that way if my teammates that don't run this perk in their loadout I could share some of them whenever I have too many coconuts. High caliber harvest for the additional loot when punching and Night Stalker for movement speed, running with the supply drop and slow field gadgets. Kind of a basic farming loadout you'd use similar to the base game, but since it's Frost Knight, you might get the idea. You can have this built in a different way, perhaps running a supercharged traps team perk on the constructor loadout if you have enough teammates farming for you and want to deal more damage with the traps, or maybe have different heroes or add something else for the farmer loadout. It, it, it all depends on how you really want to play out Frost Knight. Now that we know much on the heroes and loadout section, we're gonna proceed to what are the best weapons that we can use in Frost Knight. It's not gonna take too long because in this Save the World game, there are a lot of great weapons to craft. But for a huge guide like this, I will just showcase you the weapons that are most effective and what are the best ones to use depending on your loadout and DPS. We all know our favorite little proximity grenade launcher standing right next to us being one of the highest base damage explosive weapons in the game obviously wins a spot for frost knight whether it is supercharged or not the pot shot can deal devastating damage even towards a high power level elemental smashers what makes this the number one weapon is that it can be in any element it can be perked comprehensively like a full crit damage build or mist monster damage focus build or whatever build you can think of next weapon is our most beloved bow of all time and is still the most dominant to this day the xenon bow okay don't ask why i have multiple copies of it all I can say is each one of them have different purposes, so we'll just look at this one since having that many isn't that necessary. Of course, I did talk about Zenith and Farah previously needing a weapon like this to have their perks working as DPS. You can have a vacuum tube bow for late waves or for its damaging chain lightning, but a Xenon bow is much more all-rounded because it is an energy-based weapon that does very well against all elementals. Its arrow you shoot goes through literally anything in its path. To this current day, it will always be a great choice of weapon to craft. Another weapon that is part of the meta in Frost Knight is a melee weapon. The best melee weapon to craft is our own best buddy, the Baron. This hardware weapon can have triple movement speed in which is super useful for everyone in the team to go around as fast as they can. Triple armor is also a thing too on the Baron. In case you're a DPS or a farmer that's taking too much damage, the triple armor Baron will keep you alive as the damage you take is reduced. I rarely use the Baron in Frostline, but I have the purple schematic of the Baron so that it still has its triple movement and also cheaper to craft with rotating gizmos and fewer resources. That is why I just craft the purple Baron for my teammates so they can run around faster. And instead of crafting my own Baron, I'd rather have the double movement speed Guardian's Will. This sword's heavy attack can perform a leap which is super useful for me to maneuver around places and build much more efficiently instead of running with a big hammer on hand. It can be your movement melee weapon choice if you want to craft it, but you'll lose one movement speed of course if you have been using the Baron a lot, but to me personally, the Guardian's Will is like a signature weapon to me that it sincerely has the right speed for me even when I run Dire or Fleetfoot loadout. Well, there are so many good weapons you can use in Frost Knight, literally so many. You can go all out with explosive weapons as much as you want. If you have Demolitionist Penny in your support team, you've got the Storm King's Wrath for maximum damage, Santa's Little Helper having such a high base damage and explosion radius is nearly a half tile. If you want to run a fun shotgun loadout, Double Boiler being one of the hardest hitting shotguns in the game that can deal millions of damage would do really awesome in a high level Frost Knight. It's all about how you want to go through the waves the best way possible and effective way too, so as long as you know exactly what weapons you need for the run. So far, so good. We finally went through the quest, loadouts, and weapons. I guess we're ready to move on to the real deal of this guide. Alright, 
A full run of Frost Knight consists with 20 waves. There are certain waves you might need to keep in mind and be aware of. Some people don't memorize or predict what comes next, or know what kind of enemies are they gonna deal with, or even much worse, they don't prepare themselves to counter such waves. So for this section, I will do my best to talk about every single wave's procedure, what monsters are gonna spawn, their elements, and a couple waves you might wanna focus on countering. Wave 1. The first wave of husks start at the 3 minute mark. It's a physical element wave with not a single mist monster spawning. A couple husklings, gunslingers, and maybe pitchers might follow around to damage you. It should not be too difficult to start building off the base around the furnace. Wave 2. Almost the same type of approach as wave 1. It starts on the 7 minutes and 15 seconds mark. Wave 3. Also the same as the other previous two waves, but the break time in between are starting to get shorter. So during this wave, it's best to prepare a lava shield as soon as you get enough building materials to build up. Wave 4. This is the first kill wave of the match. Lobbers and flingers are gonna start spawning, throw husks and projectiles on top of the furnace, and perhaps randomly break a portion of your lava shield if not reinforced properly. The wave will start on the 15 minute and 35 seconds mark and will end after eliminating a certain percentage of husks. Wave 5, another physical element wave, takers will start spawning and flingers will throw as they usually do. The power level will start increasing drastically, so as their damage stats. Wave 6, this wave is the first water elemental wave. Smashers are gonna start spawning and flingers are still a thing in this wave. Jeez. No wonder they're always bugging me with repairing the lava shield. Wave 7. The wave goes back to being physical element. If smashers are gonna smash obviously, propane husks are gonna start spawning so prepare a few anti-air traps on a few floored structures, then this wave should be a cakewalk. Wave 8. This is the second kill wave of the match and the first wave for a mini boss to spawn. Since it is only the beginning, you can either choose to kill or kite the mini boss. It is as well a physical element wave, so there are gonna be some takers and blasters going around. Other than that, eliminate as many husks as you can to proceed the kill wave. Wave 9, a wave that can be a real headache for anyone that is not running a tanky loadout. Wave 9 will have takers spawn quiet frequently. There are gonna be some other mist monsters that are gonna be there too, but takers will be in heavy numbers during the wave, so make sure to keep cover or if you have a hard hitting weapon at a time, you could kill one by one. This is also the last non-elemental wave in the match. Wave 10, you may feel this is halfway of the Frost Knight match when you reach this wave, but it's actually not. This is the first wave of the fire element and will still continue to be in the next several waves. Fire smashers are gonna start spawning, as well as fire riot husks and gunslingers. They'll become very dangerous by the time their power level is higher, so perhaps getting an energy or water weapon would do best against them. Wave 11, the third kill wave of the match, and it will spawn in two mini bosses at a time. There's definitely going to be a lot of lobbers, perhaps blasters, a couple propane husks prior to the next wave after, a very few fire smashers. It might take a while to get through because the threshold percentage of the elimination increases unless you have a teammate that runs a DPS loadout to be able to clear out crowds of husks. Wave 12. This is the wave that's actually halfway of the frost egg match because at this point the waves are gonna start throwing a lot of crap on your base, starting with the bombardment with the propane husks. They will spawn very frequently, so the best way to counter this without facing a ton of lag in game is to place a fixed amount of anti-air traps on ground level to prevent the propane's blow up your tunnels and traps. And at this time of the match, they are very high in terms of power level, so make sure to prevent them from blowing up within the base as the propane explosions deals a huge damage towards players and even fully upgraded structures. Wave 13. This is another fire element wave. You can somewhat try to take it easy and repair after dealing with propanes from the last wave. Takers in this wave can be very sneaky, so keep a keen eye on them just in case. Depending on this wave's power level, their charge can wipe you out for sure if you're not careful, especially if you're not running a tank loadout. Wave 14. This wave is many players' favorite wave. 
there will be a ton of fire smashers, or Krampus I should say, spawning frequently, ready to break your structures in a matter of seconds, starting with the structures around the furnace. What you can do is have your best weapons out, especially the high base damage explosive weapons with the right element that will deal great damage towards the fire smashers. I would definitely suggest taking them out before they are able to break your whole base, that's for sure. Wave 15, similar to wave 13, but there are gonna be quite more propanes and fire smashes spawning than usual. At this point of the match, you should be very good on resources to repair the damages that the smasher did on wave 14, and craft the weapons you need to go through the rest of the end waves. Wave 16, the only nature elemental wave in the frost Knight match. Nature smashers are gonna spawn, nature riot husks and gunslingers and all that. If you build your core structures in your base metal, you might need to pay attention to this wave for sure, because those nature enemies can deal damage very effectively on metal structures by double. So even if the traps are doing work, at least get rid of the big targets like the smashers and riot husks just in case because they deal so much damage against structures generally. Wave 17 this is the last kill wave of the frost knight match and the last fire element wave this time three mini bosses are gonna spawn at once they are very high power level too so be sure to not get hit by their charge or their normal melee attack when up close you can choose to kill them if their modifiers are not that hard to kill but if three mini bosses is too much for you and your base you can try luring them out of the map by having them aggro towards you since mini bosses in frostlight are programmed to be assassins wave 18 after so many waves this is the second wave of the water element in the match there are gonna be a lot of lobbers outside the base though. Either they're gonna be beehives or bombshell lobbers, as well with some blasters and other ranged tusks that are gonna be thrown in this wave. Wave 19 is another water element wave. Every type of husks we know spawns in this wave but not too frequent. I would take this wave's time as a preparation of the next end wave since you can spend literally all your resources to finish the run once and for all. Just be careful with takers is all I want to say for this. Wave 20, the final wave of Frost Knight with the last three mini bosses you need to deal with. They are at their highest power level they can possibly go. That means their higher attack stats could potentially wipe out the whole team. As mentioned before, you can choose to either kill them or lure them off the edge of the map. After doing so, survive the last couple minutes of the match, burn all your resources since you can't keep them forever, and there's your full run of Frost Knight. Not too hard, right? That should be all of the waves that exist in Frost Knight Analyzed. If you have a build in mind that can withstand all of the waves, or you have a loadout that can counter certain waves to prevent damages on the base, or even try to spend some break times during the waves that are not packed or very busy, so as long as you know what waves does and comes next, you'll be able to easily clear a full run out of it with a good strategy in mind. Which brings us to what build can we use in Frost Knight. Of course, as a builder, so I recorded myself earlier in a different time to do a building tutorial for Frost Knight that you can simply use prior to this recording, and I hope it'll help you in a way. Okay, since I'm in the lobby to jump into a match of Frost Knight, I wanna point something out before I start this building tutorial. I'm not going to be doing the full run, obviously. I'll mostly show a build that can be very similar to the self-proclaimed retrieve the data build that also works in Frost Knight. It's just that we have to build it three to four times bigger. So the point is I want to show how the core structures are built out around the furnace, the many options of what traps are best to use and building up the lava shield. And since I'm jumping in alone, I'll try to somehow show how I usually build during my solo runs. Keep in mind, this is just my personal approach. You can build it differently than mine whenever you want to. Okay, so the first thing w that I do at the beginning is edit this uh, wall, create this wall into a window and place it around the burner. Well, ah, there goes that barrel. Well, I'm not going to be staying here for a very long time. So yeah, so yeah, I place four um, metal wall, metal windows around the burner. So just in case I needed to place blue glow from the outside. Uh, there it is for me. Right now I can also place uh, some floors just to prepare and also e and even also place my base as well. Oh. 
do that. Where do they come from? From the east. So I'll place my base on the west. There. I'm gonna be grabbing some mats. Right, I have a minute left, so let me at least uh, upgrade the windows around the burner. And uh, what I do here is just uh, place the wooden floor. Oh, not the wooden floor spike, the the wooden the wall spikes. Gosh, yeah, the wall spikes. Uh, most likely the healing one, which is right here. I can just uh, place four of these since we only have like four walls. Yeah. Right there, all spikes. One, two, three. Oh, three, four. And that should actually go on to like at least uh, wave four, and you can go around and farm uh, whatever you need until that point. So yeah, let me grab a little bit more mats just in case. Alright, so wave 1 is done. The walls are doing pretty great. Let me try to like uh, at least tier 3 them, just in case. So, I did talk about the core structures. Well, you can s keep the... you can keep the windowed walls right here on the burner, but a pretty good addition is that if you really feel like placing ramps, that is also fine. Placing ramps here on all each four directions, right there, it does work fine. And if you want to like place um, a healing, healing floor that can uh, keep the, your ramps in good health, uh, put like a heal, like a heals attached healing pad here, or maybe the wooden floor spikes also works as well. Double uh, double layering is uh, not really bad at all. So that's how that's how actually the core structures uh, actually work around the furnace. So, what I want to do right now is show you how you can build your how you can build your trap tunnel. So, uh, I'm just going to build uh, in the north place here. So, so like ab about like six tiles in, six tiles in right here. You can perhaps uh, do some way like how you did in retrieve the data. Like you have a floor floor launcher here. You want to shoot them off away. You can also have a wall right here. <laughs> Pun intended. Well. And have like maybe perhaps place a wall dart. You can place also a couple walls here, and maybe have a block off here, whatever, whatever con concept you're going for. So like for me, what I what I would do is like have a, have a bunch of wall darts around here. Or if I want to go for broadside mode, I could make a tiny block off here. This and then then have like one. Two, three. I'm not sure if I have uh, the mass for wall darts. Oh yeah, I think I do. So let's place like uh, just uh, like three wall darts here, and maybe if I can craft broadsides, I uh, will see if I can. Oh, I I can't. But uh, I I'm just showing you guys. I'm just uh, showing you how the trapping would work best for Frost Knight here. So one, two, three. And broadsides, well, I, I don't have enough for the other trap tunnel, but I think you get the idea. For the floor traps, uh, you, you could pro possibly put like maybe tarpets in case you're thinking about smashers, or maybe right husks that you don't want them to go through, or perhaps you could put uh, floor freezes just in case to turn them into a physical element whenever they're, ele uh, they're elemental husks. Let me place the blue bone here real quick. 
So yeah, in, in any case, this kind of build actually works fine. I usually do something like this as well on, in my solo matches. Uh, at some point, well, I'm kind of broke so I couldn't show the full build. Oops. Uh, so yeah, if you wanted to build in a different way possible, like uh, usually, usually m most people go like funneling into a trunk tunnel like this so that they can place the sound walls at the at the beginning here for the propanes perhaps some anti-airs around here at the corners here and there whenever there's a propane husk throwing their propane tanks at it to prevent uh, the trap tunnels from uh, blowing up so yeah there is there is a lot of options here that you can place you, know, you don't have to even put broadsides maybe perhaps all dynamos that's a little bit expensive because it's uh, nuts and bolts heavy or, and uh, some and some batteries so yeah you you make sure uh, you know what resources you're using be a little bit very consistent with the, the materials you're using especially when you're solo because yeah i am definitely solo and uh, I have to be very careful with what I build here. So yeah, that is how uh, trap tunneling uh, works as well. So even if it's uh, self-proclaimed, you can have like uh, wall darts uh, in each and every corner right here. Th they both work either way, right here. They work. I I'm not really, I'm not really going hard in this game, so <laughs> it's fine. So yeah. Yes, either self-proclaimed or trap tunneling or works really well in Frostnite as that way. Let me grab some <laughs> some blue glow and some wood as well for the next uh, phase, which is going to be the lava shield. Alright, so wave 3 just uh, kind of like started a while ago, but uh, uh, at this point I really want to show how Lava Shield would work in some way. Well, we're right now we're on wave 3, so wave 4 is going to be the Lava's and Flinger's Shield, so you may want to have your Lava Shield prepared up as soon as possible. So, right now I, I would like to start off with like ramming up a little bit here as an example this is how i just personally approach uh, building a lava shield so i have pre-edited my uh, my my roof here so just uh, three tiles out and you can start uh, building off on the right if you are uh, well i am definitely a right-handed person so i am going to start uh, on the right so you can put uh, some ramps up up to two or three whenever you feel like so all right, let's uh, just begin this one. Ah, there's a barn right here, but that's fine. I'm not really bothered that much since uh, I'm not going to do a full run here. I'm just uh, literally just showcasing. All right, so two tiles up. You can go for three, whatever. Well, let's do it. No problem. Well, the barn is uh, definitely on my way, but it's whatever. I mean, if it, if there is an obstacle, you can just uh, you can just like uh, make some sort of a blockade right here, and you can uh, go on as you build your lava shield. All right, that's uh, three tiles uh, ram up, and then now we, now we have like uh, let's see, we have. Uh, we have uh, spawns on the north and west, so you might as well. Hmm, let me get some blue glow in there just in case. All right, so y you can, you may as well just start uh, like flattening up the lava shield. Like, let's go three tiles out. There's one, two. Yeah, you just keep going yeah, as long as you have enough uh, materials to do so. Two, three. Four. So, they are going to come from the west and north, so you may want to focus on those directions at best. So, I'm going to ram up here twice. Twice, like only about two tiles in. 
tiles. The cleaners don't bother, or the lobbers uh, bother throwing at the furnace. Uh, Gosh, like I said, I'm just right-handed. There we go, now we got flingers and lovers in. Now, I do finish building this thing. Flag. Yeah, there we go. And uh, it should be functional. It is uh, a kill wave though, so you may want to see if uh, either any of the sides are going to break or whenever it's going to be thrown out, and we did find one. Okay, so for sure a flinger just uh, started throwing, well, moving around, and started, so let's just uh, try to barricade it. May w I mean, I would still recommend uh, just, uh, yeah, I would uh, just uh, recommend uh, completely building the full lumber shield because, yeah, flingers are, are not that stupid. They can just, uh, they can just move and uh, get through, get through the, your lumber shield. Oh goodness! Again. All right. So, eh, I mean, whatever. If it fails, it fails. So. Basically, that's how you build your lumber shield. Just uh, try to finish it completely, so flingers like this uh, one doesn't move around a lot and continuously shoot. Well, the barn is on my way, but uh, it don't matter. Okay, like just completely finish your lumber shield. Voila! You can still extend it like how I did right here, because there are mountains that you may. They may still be able to throw and even still stay on their spawn and just uh, continue shooting towards uh, the furnace. So you make sure to like maybe perhaps extend it if you have enough materials. I'm pretty sure I don't. But yeah, just in case. Uh, if you have a flinger like this, like in my game right now, at yours. Uh, yeah, you be careful with those kinds of flingers. They're not stupid, by the way. They are not stupid. So yeah, this is. I, I'm just showing an example of what lava shield that you need to build. Um, you can also have maybe, you can maybe start your lava shield straight directly from when you place your base right here. Like just start off uh, building like this. No need to ram up. Like just uh, straight up uh, placing. <laughs> Placing a two tile lava shield like straight up if you just don't want to like go fully upwards or whatsoever. But uh, yeah, I would say I would say that also works as well if you would really want to. But if you want to ram up, that also works both ways. Uh, really does an amazing job. It doesn't really have to be like uh, a flat uh, lava shield or a rammed up lava shield. <laughs> Heck, you can even make a make an upside down pyramid work as well as a lava shield i think i've seen that too so yeah this this is how you build a lava shield not the exact way possible of course but uh, as long as it works you're blocking the lava's uh, side to the to the furnace then you'll definitely be fine oh great i don't have any other blue glow to keep this up but anyways this is where i should conclude this tutorial i'm pretty sure you can have a different approach on the lava shield the trapping and the building base the core structures itself of course the ramps as well it's uh, it's whatever it all depends on uh, how you want a frost knight build to work whenever you just want simplicity and casual you can perhaps make a concept and build similar to this like the trap tunnel that i just did down there earlier or on a few block offs on the corner and many countless options there are plenty of ways to build that works best for you during the run and uh, yeah it can be stressful when starting off as a builder but uh, when you get to, when you when you get to, to know how to build your build your trap tunnels your like almost anything basically you're trapping right here my wall spikes uh, literally just did most of the work here <laughs> Like, all of it. So, yeah, yeah I'm pretty sure you'll get uh, the hang of it, being as a builder and what so.
Now that you've gone through my little teaching session about building, we can talk about the essential factors of Frost Knight. Of course, the furnace is not like any other objectives that just needs to be defended, like in the base game missions. It loses health itself over time, and it needs a power source that can refill to keep its health high to survive the rest of the incoming waves of husks and prevent the storm from shrinking. The blue substance that keeps the furnace lit is a must-have during the Frost Knight runs, which is known as Blue Glow. You can find Blue Glow almost anywhere that are scattered around the map. Each Blue Glow deposited in the furnace fills up its health by 20% and takes approximately 2 minutes to have the furnace deplete 20% of its health. So the perfect time to place Blue Glow into the furnace is when the bar goes down to red. You'll need more than enough Blue Glow to have it back at high health. I would highly suggest placing in 3 blue glow at a time whenever it gets low so you don't have to refill every two minutes or what so a little trick for some of you out there since i know not many people are aware of about this when the furnace goes to 25 percent or below lock will send a supplement of blue glow that will definitely help get you the extra blue glow you need without having to go out back and forth again to find more it is the most efficient way to easily keep your blue glow at a good amount for the furnace and the rest of the for frost night match lastly make sure to share some blue glow to your teammates in a consistent number whenever you're carrying more than anybody else just in case one gets eliminated in a wave because of a taker maybe a propane blew up on their faces or even got hit by a mini boss there is gonna be someone else surviving also have enough blue glow to fill the furnace just in case something happens it's all about uh, the team effort to keep the match going. So now we know the blue glow is one of the main factors and our power source of frost knight, there are anomalies and trolls that also spawn around the map for additional blue glow. What I want to point out is the locations of the ice blocks that has a blue glow inside them. They are also important for the frost knight repeatable and daily quests if you ever need those extra tickets. Starting with the first ice block, this one is located on the northwest of the map next to the slope terrain that looks like a stairway. The second ice block is located on the southwest between the hill that is two tiles high and a smaller gorge. The third ice block is just a couple tiles south from the previous ice block and is just a tip closer to the edge. The fourth ice block is on the southeast that is a few tiles away from the mom house cornered towards the wooden fences. The fifth ice block is also a few tiles away from the mom house located close to the back door of a sports bar building. The sixth ice block is also at the southeast located right behind a red bus station with a snowman carrying a searchable travel bag the seventh ice block is on the northeast close to the edge on a small six tile hill with a couple tin cans next to it the eighth ice block is also at the northeast of the map a bit south of the small residential town next to a gray house the ninth ice block is close to the first ice block on the northwest. I nearly forgot about this one. It is located next to the slope stair, but it's on a higher terrain this time, a couple tiles closer to the first ice block. The tenth ice block is about closer to the eighth ice block, but it depends on the building spawn whenever there is a chance of the ice block spawn. It is located south of the residential town at the back of a different gray house. The 11th ice block is on the very east side of the map, close to the edge of a hill, several tiles from the ore cave and the crashed ice cream truck. The 12th is at the northwest depending on the terrain spawn. It is a couple tiles south of the 1st and 9th ice blocks on the top of Plain Hill. The 13th is at the southeast about as close with the fifth ice block it is directly at the entrance of the sports bar building the 14th is on the northeast at an area close with 8th and 10th and almost a similar reason with the building spawn it is located at the front of the gray house's garage the 15th is also located on the residential town but it's on the far top left side of the town front of a smaller house right behind a boxy car this is all that i can humanly find it's not every single Single location. There might be some other ice blocks locations I've missed, but for the most part, it's probably because of the spawn points. Depending on the natural terrain and buildings around the map, the ice blocks listed here may or may not spawn at the designated areas that I've found so far. So if you did find an ice block that I missed, 
props to you. Finding blue glow is not that difficult for sure. It's all spread out around the map, whether you could run into an ice block or anomalies for extra blue glow, it doesn't hurt much trying to keep supplying yourself and other teammates with as much blue glow as possible. With that blue glow section out of the way, we can now jump into another great factor into getting frost egg done. In a team of two, a builder cannot even be able to finish their best defense base on time without looking over one another, which is their farming teammate. Being a farmer is plain and simple. Any obstacles you see that potentially has materials that can be used for the run, obviously, Grab those resources as many as you can, harvest anything that looks convenient for the base. But before you start punching those things, make sure you interact with searchable objects around. If you have Crossbone Barret in support, grab some coconuts for you and your teammates. They are very useful as a healing source in the long run. I'm pretty sure you have gone through the Heroes and Loadout section before this in the video, so you should know the drill at this point, including the Farmer Loadout. You'll also need to know what crafting materials your builder needs to craft for traps, harvest trees for planks and twines, break cars for mechanical parts and batteries, rocks for rough ore and powders, and so on. Any loot traps and weapons you find after searching stuff and grabbing the supply drops every way, recycling them for even more resources really helps out on your farming. If they're able to craft you weapons, perhaps giving them ores, crystals, and rotating gizmos for a cheap purple speed baron or purple armor baron, if a weapon you need is a legendary rarity, you might have to put some time into finding active power cells. For sure, I did mention before, some DPS loadouts might need to craft weapons early so they can start dealing damage against husks. There are a few places you might want to keep in mind when trying to loot power cells and gear up for the later waves in the match. What's first to come in mind is to search presents. There are about 5 places to find a group of presents you can search for active power cells and few of them might have a chance to not spawn as explained before on the blue glow section. Let's start with the ones that are guaranteed to spawn. First building I think of is the mom house. I call it that because it is written outside of the walls. It is a one tile box building that is located on the southeast of the map. Inside it has a lot of presents ready to be picked up at the shelves. You can also get coal out of it as well to craft blast powder and ammo. And bear in mind there is less chance you loot a power cell unless you're lucky enough out of those presents. Perhaps you'll just have to hope for one or more. Another area is the crashed site of the mail van and a couple cars that is located north of the map, west from the residential area. And a small amount of presents are scattered around and a few of them are down on the lower floors with broken porta potties a tiny little cave with a chest by the looks of it. Another good area is in the marketing area southeast. If the post office building ever spawn in your match, there are a ton of presents outside and inside that you can pick up from. A very good chance you might get a couple of active parcels out of it. This one might not always spawn, but at the west side of the map there is gonna be a crashed site of a spacecraft or a rocket that has presents scattered around the site. Not too many of them, but perhaps it's something that you could possibly possibly grab a power cell or at least extra coal, not a hard pass of course. And the last place is of course the residential houses on the northeast. They did set up Christmas trees with a bunch of presents to open up. Not the best place to find an active. Sometimes the presents are in the house, sometimes they aren't there. Instead, it's the ammo boxes. Well, I'm starting to question how that kind of family celebrates Christmas holidays. That should be the 5 places for looting active power cells. You'll for sure get them eventually because even in the later waves, husks occasionally drop them from time to time and if you run into some gnomes, you can harvest them for a chance to loot a power cell out of it. So you shouldn't worry too much in the early waves. Next thing about farming is obviously finding chests. Of course, you'll be running as an outlander build, you have the class perk that you can see containers behind walls and obstacles, so it shouldn't be too hard for you if you memorize where the chest spawns are. And as I said before, some of them might not spawn by chance, but finding are also a great way to find resources you need. Finding them are also a great way to farm resources you need. Building materials, loot traps and weapons to recycle, and perhaps some blue glow depending on the chest level. Their locations are not too hard to find. For this part, I will point out the chests that I usually go towards from start to finish. My chest route starts by running to the very southeast side of the map. There is a small underground cave that have big boulders on the way and the pit of the cave ends up facing towards the abyss. But looking at the right side, there is a terrain that is just one tile and it has a chest behind a rock. 
Next location is the underground cave at the southern side of the market area. There is a gnome and a chest that is right behind the boulder above the underground cave. After looting the chest outside, there are two chests able to spawn in the cave at the right side of the Christmas tree. After the previous four chests looted, there is this one chest on top of a mountain that looks like a pillar. Since the mantling and sprinting mechanic finally exist in Save the World, you can climb the mountain and grab the chest that is right next to the tree at the peak of it. Next chest is on the side of the bridge, behind the squared boulder. I don't always go on that part of place because it doesn't always spawn there, but it's pretty seldom it might be there. If it were to spawn as much as the previous chest, it would have been my first one instead of that one chest at the tip of the edge. Another chest that is at the northwest of the marketing area, top of a hill with two gnomes standing there to snowboard. Same reason as the previous chest, it doesn't always spawn as often. And the last two chests is at the northwest of the map, closer to the center. One chest is outside, close to some ores and tin cans to grab. And the last one is in an underground cave, deep down with all the ores and rocks. The same way with chests, not always spawning also applies to buildings in the residential and marketing areas. Sometimes you'll find the same buildings in a couple of frostite runs, whether they have the chests in the attics or not, perhaps on some roofs. It's pretty much RNG at that point whenever they're gonna spawn or not. That's why I only have a route for the ones that always spawn for quick resources. Now that you know where exactly some of the chests are and know where to find active power cells for your weapons after crafting your weapons and ready to go, it's time for you to know where exactly the three lone Krampus in matches are. The Lone Krampus drops Blue Glow in a small amount of resources. They also count towards your quest, especially the Master of the Krampus Hunt Elite Frost Knight quest, where you need to kill 3 each in 34 matches to get the 100 eliminations on the Lone Krampus. And also the daily quest Krampus Crazies, where you only need to kill 3 in that same day you have the quest. So in that case, there are multiple locations they usually sleep on. The first Lone Krampus is located on the northeast next to the grey house on the right side sleeping there. The second is on the very west of the map sleeping at the edge near a stared slope. The third Lone Krampus can be found on the bridge north of the marketing area sleeping on top of a metal farm. The fourth Lone Krampus is at the southernmost of the marketing area next to the underground cave and boulder where three chests can be spawned in this one place. Perhaps this sleeping Krampus seems to be guarding them. The fifth one is on the far east, opposite of the second lone Krampus, sleeping right next to an abandoned lumber mill. The sixth Krampus sleeps right at the edge on the northeast of the residential area, next to a possible spawn of ice block as well. The seventh is located on the north, covered by a couple trees in between and behind the stared terrain. The eighth lone Krampus sleeps in the middle of the roads in the residential area on the northeast, a very good field to fight that thing. The ninth Lone Krampus is on the northwest of the map, sleeping in between the two oil extractors. The tenth Lone Krampus can be found on the southwest of the map, close to a possible ice block. The eleventh one sleeps a couple tiles close by south of the ninth Lone Krampus with the oil extractors and next to a possible ice block spawn. The twelfth Lone Krampus is located left side of the gas station that is in the residential area. That should be the locations I have found the lone Krampus so far. The Krampus that sleeps between the oil extractors don't spawn that often from my perspective, as explained the same way about the map spawns, so just adding my two cents there. The locations can vary and only be able to have three each match, so hopefully knowing all of their locations will help as much when you want to complete the Elite Frostlight quest for the banner and the event hero. Now that we know almost every aspect and factors of Frostlight, like the loadouts, blue glow, waves, building, farming, and all of that, I will definitely make this short because this guide is more focused on the standard Frostlight, but it doesn't hurt talking about the weekly modifiers that comes and goes with their quests as well. First weekly modifier is Frosty Turf, which makes you have your foot frozen in ice cubes when standing on natural ground, making your character slide in different directions unintentionally, and the traps become frozen for a certain time after they trigger, making them have a slower reload speed, not a very bad modifier. Completing a run of Frosty Turf with the quest called Breaking the Permafrost rewards you a banner with extra gold and tickets. Second weekly modifier is Merry Melee, where you can only craft and use melee weapons 
weapons. Running a merry melee of Frostnight restricts you from crafting any ranged weapons. Completing a full run of merry melee with the merry madness quest rewards you an icicle banner with the same amount of golden tickets. Third weekly modifier is New Wave Holiday. This is more like running Frost Knight in the faster way possible because all of the waves are just elimination waves. In order to progress through the waves, you have to eliminate certain husks in order to proceed to the next wave. The quest for completing a full run of New Wave Holiday, which is called Wave Rider, gives you a banner that has a snowman surfing the wave on it. Fourth weekly modifier is Superheated, my personal favorite one of all. The furnace will have a huge red damage field around it which will be twice bigger than the shelter, which means you'll have to build your defenses twice as big too. Placing structures within the dome will take damage over time and ends up getting destroyed. This one is gonna be very challenging and resource heavy because of how expensive the base eventually is gonna be, so be careful when spending materials while playing this modifier. Completing the full run of Superheated with the Furnace Fires quest rewards you a banner that looks like a Rook chess piece. Fifth weekly modifier is Special Delivery. Instead of a Frost Knight being a ripoff of from Retrieve the Data, instead it's a Category 3 Storm mission. You don't just defend the Furnace, but also the other two dispensers. Three objectives to defend at once in Frost Knight. Blue Glow doesn't spawn as much around the map. The dispensers can produce Blue Glow as long as you keep it alive for the rest of the run. Completing 20 waves of Special Delivery with the quest through sleet and snow gives a gingerbread banner. Six weekly modifier is top it off. The storm circle shrinks way smaller and deals more damage. That's basically what it does. Almost the same way as the normal frostlight matches, you just have a storm circle that becomes smaller and dangerous. Waves have no change towards this modifier, so it should still be another pretty standard frostlight run. Upon completing 20 waves of Top It Off and the pot is half full, quest should give you a Burning Furnace banner. Seventh weekly modifier is my second favorite, Final Frost, which is the last modifier for Frost Knight and its season. This is a hybrid of four modifiers combined with Frosty Turf, Top It Off, Superheated, and New Wave Holiday. It is definitely the hardest modifier because you have the storm dealing more damage, the objective size is two times bigger, and you have slippery ground. The good thing about it is that the kill waves are a thing and can get the match finished faster if done the right way. With team comps and synergy, for sure Final Frost will not be very difficult. Completing the elite quest, the Legends of the Frost, which is completing wave 20 of Final Frost, gets you a banner with a drowning snowman. And... oh. I just realized I finally reached the end of the script. Please. This is definitely gonna be my longest guide video yet. I tried so hard looking for every little detail in Frostnight that a lot of people kind of skipped out on. But still, just in case someone asks for anything about Frostnight, this has to be the one-way go-to guide. If you do have any questions, feel free to comment down and I'll try to answer at best. Share your thoughts and let me know how your first couple of runs go after watching this and whatnot. I am happy that you're here interested in watching this guide that I have put so much effort into. Everyone loves Frost Knight, so why not make a guide out of it? Also, if you have not known already, I do my live streams on my Twitch channel, and I don't have a set schedule for whenever I get on. I usually play with people on stream and hang out, so if you haven't followed me there yet, make sure to turn on that notification bell since I'm bad at telling everyone I'm awake. My channel will be linked down in the description below. I will also link the location images on the description as well that I provided during the video for the ice blocks, chests, and lone Krampus. Feel free to link them anywhere for anyone that needs it, especially Reddit and Discord people. That should conclude the ultimate guide to beating Frost Knight. I hope you find any of the information I share here is useful instead of having to upload separate videos here and there. I try to place every aspect here all in one, with timestamps of course. Thank you for watching, it means a lot. So, happy Frost Knight to you. Take care of yourself and love yourself.